Good afternoon, welcome to another 8 Push video with Mr. Pate for Barlow High School. Today we're looking at the Civil War. Our essential question today is, how did foreign policy affect the course of the war? We're going to start out by looking at strategies and then we'll try and answer that question. Alright, let's get it, go ahead and get going. Northern advantages. The big picture is Lincoln realized the industrial edge the North had and over the course of the war is going to be better and better at exploiting it. The South had, I mean, the North, excuse me, had so many advantages, North in the blue here, in terms of technology. 97% uh, of weapon manufacturing was going on in the North. The North had almost all of the industry in the United States, almost all the clothing production in the United States, uniforms, almost all the munitions and weapon production, as I already mentioned. It had almost all of the transportation network of canals and railroads. It had better roads. It had more city infrastructure. And it has the railroads and the railroads are going to be huge. The South had very little of any of these things. It didn't have a lot of transportation, uh, didn't have a lot of cities, didn't have a lot of manufacturing. What it did have was a lot of cotton, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, it also, the North has the telegraph, and the telegraph network is going to be huge, built alongside railroads throughout lots of the North. The South has far less of it, and what this is going to do is, it's going to allow Lincoln to have a centralized like nerve system basically that he can be giving orders directly to his generals. He, he can hear exactly the in, almost instantaneously results of the battle. Uh, in the south they're going to be waiting long periods of time. It's going to be a disjointed communication system and as we saw in the American Revolution that communication difference is huge in terms of your ability to like react and make decisions. Lincoln will have the advantage the British commanders did not have in the revolution of being able to like you know make real-time decisions basically on what he wants his generals to do based on what's been happening so the north has this massive advantage they also had all of the navy uh, they had tons of foodstuff production out in the west so the, the Americans really have in the north a ton of advantages and you might look at this and say they've got all the transportation they've got the manufacturing they've got lots of food they can produce and they have a much larger population overall of citizens. How could they lose? Okay, that's a good question we'll come back to in a minute. The northern strategy they're going to use is going to try and take advantage of those opportunities. They're going to try to essentially uh, use their navy to blockade the southern coastline along the east coast and the Gulf of Mexico to stop the south from being able to send diplomats out. We'll see an incident with that in a little bit. They're going to try and stop the south from selling any cotton or receiving any weapons or money, gold, anything back uh, from Europe. Okay, and Europe's going to be a huge problem for the for the North. So the naval blockade will get better and better over the course of time. And their strategy that they're going to use is kind of broad overall strategy is called the Anaconda Plan. And the Anaconda Plan is essentially a three-part plan. It's a name you need to know. The Anaconda Plan has three parts. Number one, blockade the coast. Number two would be to take control of the Mississippi River, thus splitting the Confederacy in half. And that would, uh, that's later going to be accomplished. We'll see that on the next video with the Battle of Vicksburg that accomplishes that. But it would take away a major artery of transportation for the South and allow the North to start cutting the South into pieces. That's the first one. Later on, they'll go down. Sherman goes to Atlanta and cuts the South into further pieces. Divide and conquer is going on. So that's going to be huge, a second part, and again, the blockade gets better over time. The um, eventual capture of Vicksburg is going to uh, be a big help in terms of accomplishing the second tenet of the Anaconda Plan. The third one is it's going to take almost basically till the end of the war, and that's going to be to take Richmond, and it's going to take grant grinding down that southern army, Lee's army, for a very long time after they finally get the right general and the right strategy in place. And by that time... Uh, when you see Sherman's March to the Sea that we'll talk about, when you see Grant, we're going to be talking in the next video about something called Total War. This idea that you're fighting the Southern Society. Now, why do they need to fight the Southern Society? Why would there be this need for something called Total War, the first modern warfare style really to be used in the world? Well, it's because of the Southern advantages. Europe thought the South was going to win. Why would they think this? Well, the North would have long supply lines because the South didn't have much transportation. And sometimes they're going to destroy their own transportation. So some of this is going to be the North cutting supply lines like Sherman, live off the land. Or they're going to be building, re building and rebuilding railroads 
as they go slowly and methodically to connect their supply lines down to the south so they can maintain a food supply, equipment and supplies, uh, because you know if they could have rails take them to where they needed to go, then they could get people in a quick manner to where, where back and forth where they needed to go. Telegraph, they would be able to uh, keep communications and you know keep Lincoln and the generals aware of what was going on in different places. Uh, so that's a that's another factor. Uh, you have to occupy a massive amount of land. If you think about how difficult it was for the British when it was just over here in the original colonies trying to subjugate them. And they had this idea of just take the major cities and they'll all collapse. Well, there aren't very many major cities in the south, but there's a whole lot of land and hostile people that don't want to be occupied and taken over. So you have to subjugate the land. Uh, the, we'll talk about King Cotton in just a minute. You have to um, take over the major cities that there are, and you're going to have this long supply line issue. So these are some problems that the north was really facing. And Europe thought they would win, and, and really the ruling governments of Europe, because of balance of power politics, they want to see a divided country. For the same reason the British had tried to ally themselves with Texas and stop the United States from ever getting Texas. From the British designs of like getting out to the west and stopping the U.S. expansion there, the other countries of Europe always practiced in Europe this idea of balance of power politics, where if anyone like Napoleon got too powerful, everybody ganged up on them and tried to knock them down and stop someone from, from becoming a dominant threat to everyone else. Well, they're kind of seeing that on a global scale and trying to do that to the United States. So their governments, also their governments see kind of the arist aristocratic style of the South, where you have 1,700 plus slave-owning families that are kind of like these plantation superpower families, and you know they are basically like a nobility of the South. So the Southern aristocracy they had more in connection, they felt like, with Europe. Europe saw them as more like themselves. So, for the balance of power reasons, seeing the similarities, the governments of Europe are interested in seeing the South win, and they actually thought they would. Um, and they're kind of waiting and waiting for their opportunity to join in. And this is going to be a tightrope that Lincoln really has to walk because of that. Okay, so the Southern strategy. Um, the Southern's, Southern advantages were many. They were more used to being outdoorsmen, Horse, horse riders, uh, they were better hunters with guns and more used to using guns. They had more military academies in the South, except for West Point. They had um, better generals. I mean, you're going to see Stonewall Jackson's accidental friendly fire shooting is going to be a devastating blow to the South. Lee is, is just, you know, can like strategize circles around most of the Northern generals. And really, uh, Grant was a great general, but you wouldn't look at this and say, Oh, it's because Grant is like better strategically than Lee. Lee was superior to everybody. Grant just understood how to properly use his resources and attack and subjugate in the different role he had as the attacker. Lee, sometimes the aggressor, at other times, you know, on defense. Um, but Lee was a brilliant general. So the southern, the southern advantages were big there. They also expected King Cotton and the ability to fight a defensive war and to protect a very large amount of area that these would be... Um, trump card advantages for them eventually to winning. Um, the lack of transportation network was actually an interesting thing because the South thought this will make it more difficult for the North to invade and take us over. They will uh, struggle to use those long supply lines and get down to the South. And again, fighting defensively for something you care a lot about and have a lot of uh, pride and belief in, people can fight uh, really, really bravely and strongly. So, the southern strategy was get the aid of foreign powers through the use of King Cotton and to basically just wage this defensive war and take advantage of the massive amount of space and lack of transportation that would not be able to be utilized by the North. So, with all of those things, southern strategy, that's kind of what it was about. So, this takes us to the role of diplomacy. Okay, the role of diplomacy. You have these foreign intrigues that we're going to be looking at that go on and largely a lot of this comes from the fact that Britain and France are actively pining for southern success. So with all of that, it takes us first to King Cotton. Cotton. Of course, cotton was very, uh, very important to the, the British economy. And the, Brit the southern line of thinking had been for decades that if war ever broke out, really going back to the nullification crisis, hey, if war ever breaks out, the British mills are dependent on southern cotton, where the largest producer, which the South was, by far the largest producer of cotton in the world. And if we have a problem, 
the British mills, if they run out of cotton, they will have people laid off, unemployed, the factories will be losing money, the people will have no jobs, riots will break out, and the, the British government in particular will be forced to break the blockade. And that was a big part of that southern strategy. If the, if the British brought the preeminent navy in the world at that time over, they could smash the U.S. blockade pretty easily and then commence trade, recognize the South, give them an alliance. And they thought, even if they're not totally enthusiastic about taking on the United States and possibly entering into a war, they'll do it because they'll need King Cotton. They'll need Cotton to help them out. But what we're going to see is King Cotton fails. So why does it fail? There are several reasons it's not going to happen. First, in anticipation of the war and some boom crops and the South even greedily trying to stockpile as much money as they could, a surplus of cotton had been sold to the British in the few years preceding the war, immediately preceding the war. So the British had a surplus stock. So they don't have to immediately jump in the second that the war breaks out and they have a supply stoppage. That's not necessary, okay? A second thing that's going on at this time is that at, by the time they do have that surplus run out and they become in desperate need, the British have started developing within their own empire in Egypt and India, two of their colonies, they've got a chance to get cotton from those locations and at a cheaper price because they're their colonies as opposed to paying top dollar to the south. So the British are going to basically be able to ignore King Cotton completely as a factor that would force them into the war. So King Cotton kind of fails. What's the other reason it failed? There's one other big one, and that reason is really King Corn and King Wheat. King Corn and King Wheat. Basically a famine, as luck would have it, is going to break out in Great Britain at the beginning of the Civil War. They are struggling for food. They are not producing enough, and they're in desperate need of grains from elsewhere. Well, who's producing an abundance of grains? The West is producing that. So the United States is going to be able to sell that, and really what we come to see is food is greater than cotton. If people are starving, they're going to be more likely to riot than they are if they lose their jobs due to the cotton situation. But that doesn't happen either because of the British uh, getting Egyptian and Indian cotton from their colonies. So with all of these things happening, King Wheat and King Corn trump King Cotton. King Cotton does not materialize as the advantage the British desperately needed it to be. The Trent Affair. Now we move into some kind of these intrigues between the U.S. and British that are going to go on. The Trent. Okay, you have a British uh, ship, the Trent, is going to come down into the Gulf of Mexico, picks up some Confederate diplomats who are trying to get recognition, British support in any way they can, um, to make a deal. And the U.S. knows they're going to do that. So the U.S. is going to have one of their blockade naval ships detain the Trent and take the Confederate guys off of it. Now, keep in mind, this is no different than what happened with impressment to the Americans hundreds and hundreds of times where the British would unilaterally board their ships at gunpoint. But the British get really mad and they threaten to go to war and join the Confederate side so, of course, that would be worse than having those diplomats get there. So Lincoln apologizes, returns the diplomats, and like formally apologizes to the British for the Trent Affair and the things blow over. Okay? So the Alabama and Raiders, Confederate Raiders. The British are going to kind of, they're going to, there, there's something that you're not supposed to be having any relationship with a belligerent kind of international law unless you're their allied partner. The British claim to be neutral, and yet they're going to, basically provide the British, uh, the, the Confederates with some fast ships and they can be outfitted with, with cannon. And these ships were called Raiders. And the Confederacy is going to buy several of these for, in exchange for cotton. And they get these ready-made ships, sometimes stocked with some British sailors, certainly with Confederate officers. And they're going to go around and attack the Union shipping, commercial shipping. Uh, when you talk about merchant marine, this is non-warships that are just transportation vessels taking trade around. So as the Union has ships going out to Europe to do trade, the Confederacy is attacking by trying to sink these. And they're very successful doing it. The one that's the most notorious and most successful is the Alabama, but it's not the only Confederate raider. Well, the United States is going to get very angry about this and eventually press a lawsuit against the British after the war is over, the British will agree to pay significant damages to the United States for the fact that they kind of violated the neutrality 
and helped with that. That's called the Alabama Claims. You'll read about that soon. Uh, the Laird Rams. Okay, so you're, you probably are familiar with now from your reading the idea of the ironclads and that they have these basically chunky ships that they put iron plates all over, but now they have ships that can withstand cannon fire and that's going to make the wooden ship era over and totally irrelevant. Okay? Uh, well, the British, as the preeminent mil uh, naval force on the planet, they had all kinds of shipbuilders that were super advanced, way beyond what the United States had anywhere in New England. One of these was the Laird Brothers Shipyard, one of their top shipyards. And they had kind of invented Ironclad 2.0, which were called the Laird Rams. These were much faster, not clunky, ironclad ships. They had them fitted with like a metal spike pole that could be on the front so they could literally just ram it into and then pull it out of um, a wooden ship. And if, you know, of course, they, they had an ability to fire cans themselves. These ships basically could wreck anything on any ocean at this point. They were far better than the old ironclads and my gosh, they were certainly better than any wooden ship. Well, the Confederacy arranged to buy two of these ironclads from the British and when this happens, essentially this is going to mean, uh, this is a very pivotal point basically in the war, these Laird Rams, because if the British had sold these, if, if Laird Rams brothers, the Laird brothers uh, had sold the Rams to the Confederacy, these two ships could have gone around and laid waste to the entire Union blockade and destroyed it. And that, of course, would have dramatically changed the shape of the war and hurt the Anaconda's plan's ability to kind of squeeze with the blockade the southern uh, economy which it most successfully does during the war. Well, there's all kinds of intrigue. The, the Union has spies in near the docks trying to find out if the British are selling any more ships like they had the Alabama and these raiders. And they get wind that within literally a couple of days, these next generation devastating warcraft are going to be sent off and given to the Confederacy with a British sailor crew to very effectively run them and Confederate officers. Well, what happens? Lincoln, when he hears this, he is going to contact the British government and let them know that he considers that would be an act of war. And that this tells you how seriously the North took it. If the Laird Rams were sold and went into the possession of the Confederacy, that Lincoln says, we will invade Canada. Now keep in mind, I know the United States had toyed around with in the War of 1812 taking over Canada. This is not something like that now. The U.S. in the middle of the Civil War has a two million person plus army. And if they dispatched a half million troops into Canada, the British would have no resistance and no way to ever take that back. So the British kind of swallow hard and say, okay, uh, gulp, we will, we will uh, buy the Laird Rams ourselves. They refuse to allow them to be sold to the Confederacy and they're literally a couple of days from going to the Confederate possession at that point. It just shows you how close and how thin the margin of error was at times in the Civil War. Okay, Uncle Tom's Cabin. So why does the British government ever get involved? Um, well, we've talked about the, the King Cotton's uh, lack of necessity. We've talked about the food and famine needs. And we've talked about Lincoln skillfully avoiding some problems. Uh, the threat of an invasion of Canada at one time, as we just talked about, is going to be another thing. But the last one is Uncle Tom's Cabin. The civilian populations, the common people of Great Britain, France, and other European countries, where slavery had already been outlawed for decades, they are going to read Uncle Tom's Cabin, and it's going to have a similar effect that it had on the North. It is going to absolutely make them believe that it would be the most dishonorable and terrible thing for their government to support uh, the Confederacy in this case. So what they're going to do is basically agitate and protest and assemble any time it looks like the British government or other governments might get involved and interfere. Uncle Tom's Cabin leads to this call to action of the common people in Europe and they do not, especially in Great Britain, allow their governments to get involved. The last thing we got is the Maximilian Affair. And it's an interesting thing coming back to the Monroe Doctrine. So in Mexico, basically while the United States is occupied in the, in the Civil War, uh, Napoleon III, new emperor, at this time in France, he's going to put his brother, uh, Maximilian, on the throne of Mexico and basically take over Mexico. Now when this happens, there's nothing the United States can do about it. They're walking this tightrope. They can't even really condemn France. But once the Civil War is over, they basically immediately say, 
if you don't get your army out of Mexico and allow Mexico to be its own country again, we will send our troops down and um, force you to basically get out. And so Napoleon III is going to cut ties and basically Mexicans overthrow and execute Maximilian and his followers. And this kind of asserts the power of the Monroe Doctrine. Now the United States, at this time, with a very significant, powerful army, is kind of flexing the Monroe, Monroe Doctrine's muscles on its own instead of depending on the British. Well, that's all the time we have for today. We've covered a lot of things. In terms of answering this question, I think you can clearly see that foreign policy was pivotal in making sure the South could not realize some of its war aims and in terms of the Anaconda Plan's success. That's all the time we have for today. Stay classy, Sam Barlow.